Welcome to the Elevate Everyday Podcast. I'm joined today by Jen Trepec. Um, She's a nutrition expert, and she's got her own podcast. It's called Salad with a Side of Fries. And her big thing is like food and mood, how, how eating a certain way affects your mood in different ways. So that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about. Um, but first and foremost, Jen, I appreciate you being on the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Um, and my first question for you is, you know, just going right off of that. And there's there's more anxious and depressed people these days than ever is what the stats are showing. So what what foods and like what foods negatively affect our mood and what might be causing this? Yeah. So um, this is a big, I want to preface this by saying we're going to scratch the surface of this topic today, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right? Um, fundamentally, what we have to know is that everything that functions in our body requires building blocks, right? For our, for our cells to do what they're supposed to do, for our body to perform, we need raw materials. We need building blocks. The building blocks of, I'll say it this way, the building blocks of mood are neurotransmitters, Okay. How we feel every day is a function of neurotransmitters. And we know these, right? Serotonin and dopamine and GABA, right? Endorphins. We've heard these terms before. Yep. These are all neurotransmitters. We need the neurotransmitters and we need them in an appropriate balance in order to feel well, to feel happy, yep. right? When there's an imbalance, we feel the opposite, right? We're, our, we're a little down. It's harder to get ourselves to do things. We want to just sit on the couch or stay in bed, right? So things that can lead to neurotransmitter imbalance is not eating foods that give our bodies the building blocks to make those neurotransmitters. But sure. that also looks like um, lots of an increase in saturated fats, okay. an increase in sugar and processed foods, um, sensory overload, right? When was the last time we just paused right. and had no input, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I say that with a lot of compassion because I too am a work in progress on the sensory input, right? <laughs> like yeah. I am queen of the multitaskers, right? Um, by that token too, chronic stress, yeah, right? Toxins. So toxins, both in terms of alcohol or cigarettes or vaping mm -hmm. and toxins from the environment and the air we breathe or our couch off gassing, right? We have toxins from a variety of places. And then two, you know, genetics certainly plays a factor, although less than people want to believe. Right. And then bowel disruption too, bowel dysfunction. So blood flow too. I mean, everything Mm -hmm. right? We have to get blood to the brain. And how do we get these nutrients to where they need to be? Blood flow, right? Blood transports all of these nutrients. So it's really important that we give our body the building blocks of all of these neurotransmitters and eliminate or minimize to the extent that we can, right? These factors that are creating the neurotransmitter imbalance. Right. Yeah, lots, lots of different factors. It's a very, very loaded question for you right off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so so a lot of those, like you mentioned, like um, certain types of fats to avoid and, and processed foods and toxins that we're getting. Um, so so with that being said, like, you know, that that's a lot of things to to kind of be aware of and try to check off. Like what what are ways that people can improve their neurotransmitters by like adding stuff in? Because we talked about removing some things just now. Um, and, and so with like the serotonin and the dopamine and everything that we're yeah. trying to improve and improve our mood, like what are some, some maybe foods that we could steer towards that help with that? Absolutely. So we want to focus on, um, omega-3 fatty acids. So nobody's favorite, but sardines, anchovies, <laughs> um, 
sure, salmon, um, but the deep sea fish, less mercury, higher concentration of omega-3s, even a high quality omega-3 supplement, like three to six grams mm. of clean DHA and EPA specifically, um, and omega-3s by themselves, not omega-3s and sixes, not three sixes and nines, but you know, clean, I can give you a link if you want to put in the show notes for some omega-3s. Um, amino acids are a big yeah. one. So amino acids are the building blocks of protein. Right. Amino acids are also the building blocks of neurotransmitters, which means we need quality protein and all of the essential amino acids in order to be able to build all of the neurotransmitters. Yeah. Now, Essential, whenever anybody hears the word essential related to a nutrient, it means that our body cannot make it on its own. So an essential nutrient means we must consume it or take it in a supplement, that the body cannot synthesize it. So there are uh, essential amino acids that we must get. Now, if you eat animal protein, you will get all of the essential amino acids. If you're focusing on plant protein sources, we need a greater commitment to understanding the amino acid profile mm -hmm. of different things so that we're making sure that we're getting all of the essential amino acids. Right. Um, we talked about blood flow, right? Antioxidants and minerals, tremendous for blood flow. Right. I think to stabilizing blood sugar, right? Elevated blood glucose has adverse effects on the integrity of the neurons in the brain, right? Consequences for cognition. Right. So decreased cognition, decreased cognitive function. Our brain doesn't work as well <laughs> with elevated blood glucose, but yeah. that's not to say that we're going to function with glucose, you know, that's always too low. Right. The objective is to keep our blood sugar in sort of a middle range. And the way we do that is by eating protein and fiber. So protein is clean, lean protein, whatever you want that to be. Fiber is vegetables and sometimes fruit. Yeah. Yeah. That combination helps keep our blood sugar stable. And then we want to make sure that we're having those quality, healthful fats, the omega-3 fatty acids, right? I will say decreased omega-3s, increased refined foods, processed foods, increased saturated fats, all create a decrease in what's called BDNF or brain-derived neurotrophic factor, mm. right? our brain's capacity to function. The decrease in BDNF is connected to anxiety and depression, metabolic disorder, and cognitive decline. Wow. So we must focus on these elements to give our bodies what it needs, right. right? Now, the other thing that I think is really interesting is people will say to me, well, I'm not really motivated, right? Like, okay, all of that sounds great, but in the moment, it feels like climbing Mount Everest naked and barefoot <laughs> to choose the omega-3. Like sardines is no one's first choice. I get it, right? right? <laughs> Which is why we might choose a supplement in that regard. But, you know, on any given day, especially starting the day with some quality protein, like 30 to 40 grams of clean, lean protein mm -hmm. in the morning sets us up really well. But for a lot of people, their typical breakfast is... A bagel. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. So heavy. Yeah. Yeah. And in that moment, it's like, oh my God, you want me to eat what? <laughs> right. <laughs> so when we think about that piece of it, we also want to think about the connection between the gut and the brain. Okay. So there is a literal nerve that connects the gut and the brain called the vagus nerve, V A G U S. Okay, also referred to as cranial nerve X or cranial nerve 10. The vagus nerve as the literal connection between the gut and the brain plays a powerful role in all of this, right? We've You maybe have heard serotonin is created in the gut, right? right? Serotonin is one of our happy hormones, <laughs> right? Yeah. So if we're challenged with gut health, right? If we have gut dysbiosis, we're certainly going to see a difference in our mood. 
And here's the other thing with the vagus nerve that connects the gut and the brain. I like to think of it like a five lane highway. Three of the lanes go gut to brain. Two lanes go brain to gut. Hmm. So what that tells me is that we will never outthink the biochemistry of what we are putting in our gut. Right. Right? So perhaps in the beginning, what we need more than motivation, right, is discipline, Mm -hmm. is a commitment, Mm -hmm. is compliance to say, I'm going to do this and see what happens, even when we aren't necessarily feeling like it, (laughs) right? right? (laughs) We're going to be compliant to see how this plays out. Because if we're waiting for the motivation that's coming head first, it's going to always feel like you're climbing Mount Everest naked and barefoot. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that is a huge point that I'd like to just like double click on. Um, And, and it kind of ties back with what you said about um, like about your blood glucose. And I read this book called willpower and they talk about, yeah, they talk about how a big part of our willpower is just having the right (laughs) glucose levels like and, and like you said, it's like if it's too much, we feel foggy. That's a lot of times I used to even do a lot of intermittent fasting. And I'm gonna ask you a question on that too. Um, but like I used to do a lot of intermittent fasting and I, I love the clarity actually. So I think it's kind of finding that in between because also, but then I would get to a point where yeah, I was starting to like lose my willpower and feel like I was going crazy because I felt like the glucose yeah. was too low. So it's kind of finding that balance. Um, so I, I like what you said about the protein and the fiber and just like keeping that balance glucose level throughout the day. And I think that's that's where you feel that clarity and you feel good and you feel like you have that willpower. And like you said, then I feel like you have um, kind of the the mental space and motivation to make those right decisions um, because you created that like kind of internal biochemistry that exactly feel the right way to do that. So exactly. Yeah. Interesting. So, so with, I got a couple of questions kind of picking back, there's a lot to unpack there, but um, with the intermittent fasting thing, like say someone does enjoy intermittent fasting um, and, and they like the way it makes them feel and helps them stick to a certain amount of calories throughout the day. Because that's that's what I found the big benefit in intermittent fasting or time restricted eating is, is like it helps you just restrict your calories and, and eat in a certain period. Like a lot of people just see progress just from doing that. But say for someone in their fasting window to help make sure that they're like, not having certain, not having certain cravings or just not like throwing their glucose levels all out of whack. What are, what are some of your recommendations and just kind of thoughts on that? So I'm challenged in answering because it is very specific person to person. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll back up to say, I like intermittent fasting better for men than for women. Okay. Full stop, the intermittent fasting, the time-restricted eating that I would recommend is two to three hours before bed, we Mm. stop food Mm. and we begin food within an hour to 90 minutes of waking up. Your fasting time, proper time-restricted eating, biological time-restricted eating, your fasting time is when you sleep. Yeah. I actually love that. I was just going to say that's, that's what I've been doing because I used to be extreme with the fasting. And then I, I, I recently switched kind of what you're saying, just stopping eating before you go to sleep. Two hours before bed to within an hour to 90 minutes of waking up. Yeah. And if you really want to go, you know, push it sun up to sundown, Mm -hmm. we eat when the sun is up. We don't eat when the sun is down. Mm -hmm. Right. Other than that, I'm not the biggest fan of intermittent fasting, especially for women. And I'm also a bit counter to the focus on calories because fundamentally you and I both know, and nobody needs a nutrition degree to know that 300 calories of M&Ms and 300 calories of carrots are going to affect the body differently. Right. Full stop. So thereby, it's not actually a function of calories. It's a function of the quality of the calories. Mm -hmm. 
So I prefer to focus on the quality of the nutrition that we're getting rather than focusing on calories. And by that token, the Council for uh, Responsible Nutrition did a study. They looked at people, Not this has nothing to do with fasting, just people getting the minimum requirement of nutrients. Mm -hmm. They looked at three categories. The first category was people who only ate food, nothing, no foods that were made from enriched flowers or things like that, right? So that the first category was only people who ate foods that didn't have any extra nutrients added back in. The second category is people who did eat those enriched foods, those enriched grains. And then the third category of people were the people who ate all of those things plus supplemented, plus used supplements. The only people who met the minimum requirements are the people who use supplements and ate all those other things. So what that tells us is that a vast majority of people given 24 hours a day to eat do not provide the body with the fundamental building blocks that it needs. And by the way, those nutrient requirements are based on or were based on the body not deteriorating into rickets and scurvy. Came about around World War II in function of what do we have to feed our soldiers in order for them to have the minimum amount of function. So that nutrient requirement is not even about health. It's not about vitality. It's not about longevity. <laughs> it is literally like minimum to not develop, Wow. you know, That's crazy. diseases of malnutrition. Yeah. And nobody, almost nobody meets that requirement given 24 hours a day to eat and all the calories in the world. So we don't have a problem with food. We have a problem with quality food and yeah. nutrition, yeah. right? We're a country of people who are overfed and undernourished. Mm -hmm. So if your focus is calories, I'm going to urge you to focus on nutrients instead of calories. And by the way, your body can self-regulate when it has nutrition. So your body can self-regulate chicken. Your body can self-regulate celery. Your body cannot self-regulate potato chips, hmm. right? And a lot of times if we are eating foods that are deplete of nutrients, our cells go, I still need things. Right, yeah. And so it continues to send hunger signals mm -hmm. till it gets what it needs. Yeah. Well, if we keep giving it food like substances and not anything with nutrients that it knows what to do with, it's going to continue to send the hunger signal. Yeah. And those foods are also made in such a way that they hit the tongue in just the right way and they hit the brain in just the right way. And they have chemicals in them that actually turn off our brain signals of satiety. It turns off our brain's ability to say, I'm done. So to everybody who has ever been challenged only eating a few chips, right? Or what's the Pringles, right? Like once you pop, you can't stop. Like that's not your fault. That's chemical. They designed that, right? Yeah. You actually don't have a function of willpower and probably your chemistry is working as they designed your chemistry to work with that food. Yeah, yeah it's, it's crazy. Like that's one of the most common things I hear when I like get on initial calls with people. Like if they're, you know, thinking about working with me and everything is so many people eat like one, maybe two meals a day, but it's just like garbage food. And they, and they're like, Man, I, I'm not overeating. Like why, why am I not right. reaching results? And it's like, then when we, when I eventually get people on a plan and they're eating three, four meals a day, but it's like good nutrient dense food. Like you're saying, it's like, they're, they're like, I can't even eat it all. <laughs> like it feels yeah. like so much. So I completely. Yeah. Agree. And by the way, when you're not eating enough, right? When your blood sugar is low, your body does not know that there's a refrigerator full of food that you're choosing not to eat. The body says, well, wait, it must be a time of famine. Mm -hmm. And our body in its infinite wisdom is designed to stay alive. So the body says, all right, time of famine. You're not going to kill me. I will survive. Here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to take everything you give me and I'm going to store it so that I can survive, yeah. right? That is fuel stored to be used later. So when you eat one meal a day, right? The OMAD, <laughs> right? When we eat one meal a day, when we go for long periods of time without food and then eat, yeah. and the body experiences that as a time of famine, what you do eat, even if it is, if this even existed, a textbook meal, right? Let's say you then eat steamed shrimp and vegetables. Yeah. Your body will store it as fat because your body's objective is to survive. Mm -hmm. So it's worth thinking about what are your goals? What's your timeline? What's your commitment level? And then adjusting everything to match those pieces. Yeah, it's, I was literally just having a conversation with one of my clients today about that under eating bit where it's, you know, people think I'm under eating and that's why I'm not losing weight, but it's actually, it's the inconsistency of it. Like you said, it's like you're under eating one day and then the next day when you do introduce a, a normal amount of food, it's like your body doesn't know what to do with it because it's been starving and it's just going to store it. Like you said. Well, there's sort of two sides to that because we aren't, we don't have the same hunger every single day. That's perfectly natural, right? So it's not that you have to abide by this menu and live in this box and never vary. Right. And that, by the way, could happen within a single day of not eating for, you know, long periods of time, expecting the body to perform and then having a big meal. Right. Or trying to cram the entire day's worth of nutrition into a couple hours. So there's nuance to all of it. And that's where, to your point, you know, a lot of times people come to me and like, I can see exactly when we look at a couple typical days. I see exactly why they're storing fat, why their body won't release it. No. You know, stress is also a big piece of that, which also plays back into what we were talking before about mood mm -hmm. and those neurotransmitters and eating up all of our B vitamins, you know? So I think the good news of it all is that we're not doing different things for our stress than we are for our metabolism. And we're not doing different things for our mood than we are for the other pieces, right? The good news is that everything to address everything are the same fundamental pieces, Okay. <laughs> right? We, we just got to fit them together, the different puzzle pieces. And sometimes depending on what's happening, we may put an emphasis on one thing versus the other, mm -hmm. right? But the good news is it's all the same stuff. Right. right. Quality in, quality out, get up and move more, build muscle, right? Give your body the building blocks that it needs from the nutrition that we're providing, potentially supplement also, right? <laughs> With high quality supplementation. And we can start to see the difference in our mood, in our energy, in our sleep, right? In our cognitive function, in all of the ways that actually matter in life. Yeah. yeah. And so some of my clients are vegan or vegetarian. And, um, you know, like you mentioned amino acids, sometimes that's, that's difficult when there's no animal meat and protein like that. So I, I was recommending to them some essential amino acid supplements is what's, what are your thoughts on that? And do you have certain ones that you like that you've recommended and just kind of what are, what are your thoughts on vegans and vegetarians getting all that stuff that they need in? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to why you're choosing to be vegan or vegetarian. And are you willing to then have a greater commitment to understanding the amino acid profile of different foods? Are you willing to have a greater commitment to supplementation? Are you willing to have a greater commitment to these other factors in order to make up for this other choice? Right. Right. And there is no right or wrong right? There is no good or bad. It's all just choices and understanding the give and the take with the choices that we're willing to make. So there are some amino acid supplements that I really like. There are some that I wouldn't recommend. And I think that's sort of the pros and cons of supplementation in general is it really does require somebody who is kind of deep in this space to help people choose because there are a lot of options out there, 
Um, and so it makes the argument for working with somebody who knows what they're looking at, can potentially make some recommendations and help make sure that what you're getting is not only bioavailable, but a high quality and doesn't have, you know, other toxins or things like that in it. Um, but as simple, you know, with my vegan vegetarian clients, you know, their focus is, you know, if you have beans and rice, you're going to end up with all essential amino acids. Now, those don't even have to be in the same meal. At one time, the research was like, okay, eat them together. Now, what we see is they can actually just be in the same day and you're okay. okay. You know, um, some other ones like amaranth is a grain that has way more protein than a lot of the other grains. Um, you know, um, I'm trying to think of what else we were doing, like your nuts and seeds have a little bit of protein. They're really giving you more quality fat, but it all adds up. Yeah. Right. Um, and nutritional yeast is another great one, right? It has that cheesy nutty flavor, but it's packed with protein. But in it, to your point of making sure that we're getting all of the essential amino acids, we just need to have a greater commitment to looking at that and formulating our meals. And if we're not willing to do that, then we want to think about what else, you know, where's the give and the take. Yeah. One of the things that I say to everybody is telling me that you are vegan or vegetarian tells me what you don't eat. Your health is a function of what you do eat. So it doesn't matter to me that you're vegan or vegetarian if what you're choosing is bread, pasta, baked goods, and all of the meat substitutes, your health may not be improved mm -hmm. by choosing vegan vegetarian options. So it's that's part of why I go back to why are we choosing vegan vegetarian and what does your vegan look like? Yeah. So, and with that, like, you know, we talked about the amino acids, but also like, do you think that people can supplement with some of the vitamins and minerals that they're not getting in? If they're like, do you think supplements kind of cover all the bases or is, is there a way like vegans and vegetarians, like they, they just need to add in certain foods to get that amount? Like, is there a way to kind of make both? Up? Okay. You cannot supplement your way out of poor nutrition. Yeah supplementation is designed to fill in the gaps where our nutrition falls short, but we also don't want to become supplementarians, yeah. right? So combinations tend to work the best. Yeah. We don't want to rely on the supplements and then make um, insufficient food choices because we think that the supplements are going to take the place of that, right? Everything kind of needs to work together. As I often say, you cannot run your fork and you cannot supplement your way out of poor nutrition. Yeah. You know, if we're playing that game, yeah. right? It's like having a house fire and then pouring a thimble of water on it. It's always going to be two steps back, one step forward. Yeah. And you're gonna be like, what's wrong, right? Yeah. <laughs> If we have this raging house fire and you pour a thimble of water on it, you're going to say to me, well, water doesn't put out fires. Uh, well, no, not a thimble of water on a raging house fire. And that's the scenario when we say, I'm going to eat all of these things and rely on the supplement to give me the nutrition. And I think it's it's not only just deficiencies, but I think it's also people with with hormone issues a lot of times, same thing. It's like, like, you're right. saying, like there's a, there's a root cause on why it's being super hard, even when we're sticking to, to certain foods on why you're not seeing the goals that you're reaching for. So I think combination or one of those two, a lot of times people don't realize, and it's like, you got, you got to get that stuff checked out and kind of get to the root of the cause a lot of those times. Um, but yeah, the, another thing I wanted to ask you, and then we'll, we'll probably ask like one or two more questions and then wrap it up for everyone. Sure. But, um, as far as myths with nutrition, like, what do you, what do you think are the most common myths that everyone seems to believe that's just complete BS out there? 
Oh my God. So many. <laughs> um, I'll start with it. I have, uh, done a lot, um, on BMI is BS. So BMI looks at height, weight, Yeah. A, an advanced calculator will take into account your age. It does not look at body composition. Mm-hmm. Our health outcomes are a function of body composition. How much of that total weight is muscle and bone versus how much of that total weight is fat? Yeah. Right? So BMI, looking at total number on the scale and your height, is not actually giving us an indication of health or health outcomes. And I went because... I geek out on the science and trying to understand it all. I was like, well, where did this even come from? Like, why did we start using this metric that is so fundamentally flawed, right? Turns out it was discovered and originally used to look at populations over time. So all of the people in North America versus to compare to all the people in Europe yeah. over time, like decades and centuries. It was in fact never designed for individual evaluation. And it was adopted by our medical system to make it easier for our health professionals to have conversations with their patients about weight. Mm-hmm. Rather than actually educating our health professionals, rather than teaching them how to have challenging conversations rather than teaching them nutrition because I've worked with enough doctors in my practice to know that even those who had a ton of nutrition had like 11 hours of nutrition courses in all of med school, Hmm. not 11 credits, 11 actual hours, (laughs) right? Um, So instead of teaching our health professionals how to have those conversations and about nutrition, They were taught to talk about BMI. So if you go to the doctor and they tell you that based on your BMI, your BMI, you are obese. I want you to take it with a grain of salt, ask them if they have a way to measure your body fat, they're going to say no. And then you're going to say, okay, I do. Here's what my body fat percentage is. Please add it to my chart. And we will keep track of that. And by the way, for anyone, you can also tell your physician that you do not want to be weighed. You are allowed to deny that. So reclaim control of your health, (laughs) you know, especially if your doctor's comments that you are obese is going to send you mentally triggered, right? Like you don't have to subject yourself to that. I feel like I'm in, um, I'm, in, I'm in a battle against the world to just <laughs> just get everyone to get a body fat percentage measurement and, and get the real the real measurement that's that's going to tell them like where they're at with their health because yeah the BMI is just it's just ridiculous I, I think they told me when I, like sophomore year of high school that I was obese <laughs> it's just like, right it's just ridiculous. right and I mean you can use you know there are all sorts of scales that you can have at home your gym probably has like an Omron you know, handheld, they're all going to be a little bit different. Yeah. So the trick to all of it is use the same one, the same time of day when you do the measurements. Uh, what, what's one thing that this is something I ask every guest, what, what's one thing you'd like to challenge the listeners? Cause like, I'm all about like, don't just listen and just, you know, just absorb information, like put stuff into action right away. Right. So what's, what's one thing you'd like to challenge the listeners to, to take action on right away after listening to this? Um, I'm going to give you two, but they're sort of connected. So it's all at the start of the day. No caffeine before food. So coffee with food, fine. Coffee before food, no bueno. Number one. And number two, starting the day with 30 to 40 grams of protein. What's, it what's could be, I was going to say, what's the reason for the no coffee before food? You're, uh, it disrupts our hormone balance, right? So cortisol is naturally higher in the morning, right? That's cortisol is the stress hormone. It's gotten a really bad rap, but cortisol is really important, yeah. right? It's what gets us out of bed in the morning. So the curve of, 
you know, what cortisol is supposed to look like in the body over the course of the day, it's higher in the morning. When we add caffeine to that, it can basically disrupt our adrenals and disrupt the balance. And a lot of people will end up in adrenal fatigue. So if you end up where you are struggling to get through three, four o'clock, right? You need that afternoon pick me up. If you feel like six, seven o'clock, you could fall asleep. And then at 10, 11 o'clock, you have a second wind and you're wide awake and now you're up till 12 or one. We likely have some hormonal imbalance and adrenal issues happening. So we can ride the wave, <laughs> right? Of using our cortisol and setting our body up naturally and then having a little bit of the caffeine, if we really enjoy it and have that ritual. And some people do, right? But we don't want to end up in this adrenal overdrive and endocrine disruption from the caffeine before food. Right. And it, so it's more more of the timing than the the food, right? It's more more so we're trying to wait that 90 minutes when when it's actually the cortisol or how long is the timing of so so it's sort of so we're sort of conflating two things so one thing is within an hour to 90 minutes we want fuel in our body okay. the fuel to start the day is 30 to 40 grams of protein and if you you know fiber and some quality fat in there too awesome have your caffeine with your food fine but starting our day with caffeine and then waiting for fuel mm -hmm. disrupts our hormones okay Gotcha. Yeah. And the, the other thing I was going to say on that too is in like to get your expertise on this, because I've heard the cortisol bit with the, the caffeine and, and waking up. So the other thing is what caffeine does, it binds to our adenosine receptors. Um, and so is it true that like basically that that doesn't have any effect right when you wake up because you're, you're kind of just like starting fresh with with adenosine or what what's what are your thoughts and expertise with that with those effects? I mean, I'm trying to just think through it logically and the piece comes back to like, maybe, right? It kind of also assumes that everybody's functioning properly. And I think the reality is that we're starting from a baseline where we're not functioning properly. And the objective is to help restore the body to proper function. And so that starts with minimizing the disruption. You know, so... I don't know that it's necessarily the case that you don't feel the effect of caffeine in the morning, even anecdotally. Yeah. Right. I think there are a lot of people who do. Um, Maybe just, the, you know, I the, think, the, yeah. The full effects of, of like what it's going to do for you. Like it's, it's like, you might as well wait that extra, you know, bit of time so that when the adenosine does start to, to want to bind, like you're, you're blocking it with the caffeine. That's, that's just kind of where my mind goes with it. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's certainly possible, yeah. you know, um, you know, I, and again, it kind of depends on somebody's timing. Like, is there a difference in 30 minutes versus 90 minutes? Maybe, I don't know, you know, but I would also say to somebody that providing the body with proper protein, fiber, quality fat to start your day is a much more sustained source of energy than the caffeine by which you might even find that you don't need it, right? So it's also about just understanding like, what's our goal? Yeah. How are we feeling throughout the day? And again, making sure that we're not having that caffeine too late in the day where it's then disrupting, you know, our sleep. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Awesome. Yeah. I should have a lot more time. I feel like we could, <laughs> we could spend all day talking about this stuff for sure. Uh, but maybe we'll maybe we'll be able to have you back in the future, Jim. But sure. Yeah, I appreciate this. This is very, I don't know, like every time I talk about nutrition, I feel like I I know less because I, right. <laughs> I just keep like learning more, but it's kind of funny. It's like people think People think they know everything when they don't know that much. And then you start to learn more and it feels like you don't know as much. It's like a hundred percent. I will say one of the things is that I am an insatiable student wow. and it's part of what, you know, has allowed me to continue growing my practice and helping more people because, you know, 
we are learning more and more the pace of scientific education and the human body is growing faster and faster too. So a lot of what we once learned, a lot of what, you know, was taught even still is taught in, you know, schools for dietitians and nutritionists is very outdated. And so it, it is incumbent on all of us to keep learning. Where, where are some places that people can go to get like up-to-date new information? Like where, where are some places that you go to get new research and things like that? Yeah. Um, there's a few people that I follow, uh, Dr. Deidre Mason. Um, I do like Gary Brecka. Um, I like, um, I take, you know, Gary Brecka, Huberman, um, even Peter Atia, like a lot of these, I, I have a little bit of a love hate, um, <laughs> but a lot of times, right. We can learn from there and then keep digging. Yeah. That's, you know, that's and yeah. 90% of the time where I'm going and learning is a function of what's coming up for my clients, mm -hmm. you know, and what I'm noticing for myself. Yeah. And then kind of going down those rabbit holes. I also love, you know, JJ Virgin and a lot of people like, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there who are, um, you know, in the same conversations that I am. And it's nice to compare sort of what they're seeing and what I'm seeing. And, you know. Yeah. This, and yeah. you can go down such a huge rabbit hole with this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I agree with what you're saying. It's like, because because also you have to look at with where you're at and look at look at where the people are at that are talking about these things too right it's like if if you're watching someone who's 50 years old talking about nutrition that their goals and their aspirations and with what what they're going for may be different from what you're going for you know with wherever you're at so so yeah i think it's just important to get multiple sources of information um and just stay up to i the, yeah know. i have an episode um called my top 5 tips for digesting nutrition news that I would actually recommend, like, if you are somebody who is, you know, bombarded with all of this on social media and, you know, in the headlines and all those kinds of things, listen to that episode. You got to take it with a grain of salt. You know, we have to learn to be very um, critical listeners and understand the different pieces. Yeah. And fundamentally, we have to know what works for us. We need a foundation of biology and, you know, approachable science of the human body from which we can then evaluate all the other things that are coming at us because we don't want to end up in shiny object syndrome, Yeah. right? Where today we think we're doing keto, but we really learned what keto is from that headline. So, but somebody else did it and they look great. So now I'm trying it, but I don't really know what I'm doing, right? And then tomorrow we're doing intermittent fasting just because we forgot to eat because we were stressed out, right? Like we... <laughs> We want to have a foundation of information to then evaluate what's coming at us and find consistency for ourselves because consistency makes all the difference yeah. in our results. Sure. Um, and I think, you know, the last piece on that is working with someone who can help you with the how. So we might go to our doctor and they say, lose weight. They don't tell you how, mm -hmm. right? We might go to, you know, somebody else who says, oh, watch, you know, watch what you're eating or, right. But how, what does that look like? Oh, I, if you're somebody who lives in the land of shoulds, right? I should be working out. I should be eating the vegetable. I should be whatever, right? If you're living in the lands of shoulds, we need some help to get into the living and doing and being. Mm -hmm. And that's where a coach comes in, yeah. right? Well, let's figure out how to get the vegetable in there, right? There's no shame. We've never been taught a lot of these things. We got to figure it out. Yeah. And there are people equipped to help you do that. So I encourage everybody, find the support. Nobody wins for making this the hardest. You know, every person who excels in anything has a coach, has guides, yeah. has people who teach and, you know, help them facilitate all the things that they want. So you don't have to do it alone. Right. Um, yeah. And, and so I think you were asking before too, um, you know, I have a freebie for everybody on my website. My website's a salad with a side of fries.com. 
Um, on there, there's a freebie you can download. It's not what to eat, but how to eat. Huh. Because if you feel like you're not eating dessert, if you feel like you can never eat dessert again, you can, <laughs> right? It's about how we do those things. Right. So that's available for everybody. And then, you know, of course, more of all of this on salad with the side of fries. So wherever you like to listen to podcasts, we're there. Awesome. Yeah, I was going to ask anywhere else besides the the podcast and the website that you just mentioned that you want to send people or anything else you want to promote, anything like that? Yeah, so I think the freebie is a great piece, the podcast. Yeah. Um, I do both one-on-one -on -one and group coaching. Everything starts with a complimentary discovery call. Um, so please, please reach out. All social media, I am at Jen Trepek, J-E-N-N-T-R-E-P-E-C-K. I love hearing from you, so please reach out. Awesome, Jim. Well, I appreciate you. And guys, um, you know, like we said, put this stuff into practice right away. Don't just listen, you know, mindlessly, <laughs> you know, think critically, um, think about it, you know, from a, from an educated perspective, start educating yourself on all this stuff, you know, maybe look towards some of those sources that Jen mentioned, reach out to her. If you're serious about, you know, getting a, a coach and, and some real help in this area. Um, other than that, guys, we'll see you in the next episode. And in the meantime, elevate every damn day. So appreciate you guys and appreciate you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Peace. Elevate. Only obligation is to tell it straight.